Hi. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Gay is not sin, and Jesus is not asking the gay person to change and be straight. You know, these are really great times. We're closer than ever for when Jesus is going to return here to earth. <laughs> and just before that, a few years before that, he's going to what we call the raptures. Those are the people that are alive and still believe in Jesus will be taken off earth and instantaneously given a spirit body and be raised up to heaven where Jesus is actually in the air here. And the dead will have just already, just er, earlier, rose from the dead. And as they rose, they went into their spirit body. And so the dead and the living met Jesus in the air. And Jesus gave his rewards out to all those that believed in him. And so this is really key. When you read about the rewards are given up, given out, then you're talking about you're right there at the rapture. And what we hear preached today often is the rapture takes place, but that's not the time frame for the rewards to be given. So what are you going to do? Dangle in air for, for a while before the reward's given? In Revelation uh, chapter 11, verse 18, it tells you that that's when Jesus is giving the rewards to all that love him. And so, Revelation 11, verse 18, is probably a key uh, verse that tells you a really good, fairly precise time of when the rapture is. Now, we don't know exactly when he's coming that first time. You can know when he's coming back physically and touching his foot onto the Mount of Olive back on earth and starting his kingdom for 1,000 years. You can know pretty much if you're aware of a peace treaty that's signed in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestine. If you know that happened, and we should know because it should be in the news. The way the news is, we hear it about it 24-7. And so we should know when a peace treaty is signed. Another thing you might know is that suddenly that very same time, two witnesses will come on the scene. Somehow or another, they will have done something which got world attention. And so we know that the two witnesses ministry began at that time. But the key element that we'll most likely know is when that peace treaty is signed. When that peace treaty is signed, then you can take out your calendar and you can look to see the day. You can know what day it is and what the date is when Jesus will actually be back on earth. Because that's not a mystery. That's not a secret cut return. Once the peace treaty is signed, we'll know exactly when Jesus is going to return basically physically. That's where he actually comes down. He's just killed everybody in a war we call Armageddon. And then he touches his foot down on the Mount of Olive. We can know that time if we're aware of it. Now, as we see over history these past 2,000 years, whenever there might be a significant looking prophecy fulfilled, there's a lot of stuff around it that kind of makes it, you know, a bonus feature for skeptics or unbelievers. They could say, no, this is what really happened or something. Maybe when this peace tree treaty is signed, it'll be all so muddied down that we think that it's not such a big deal. And so maybe most of us Christians will just pass over that and not even think anything of it, that that has nothing to do with prophecy. But if we're aware of what's going on when that peace treaty is signed, then we know that seven years later, Jesus will return. But Jesus is going to return another time. He's going to be basically invisible to everybody. And what will happen at that time is the people that are alive but believe in Jesus will be suddenly changed. We have movies about it where 
clothes end up just laying on the ground where they fall. You, you, you look at it, the body just came out of the clothes. So the clothes just lay as they were. And um, because that's what's going to happen. We're going to slip out of our clothes, whatever we're wearing, but immediately slip into our wedding gown. That's right, because when we go to meet Jesus in the air, we need to be ready to marry him. We have scriptures that tell us about, about you need to be dressed and ready uh, for the wedding. And if you're not, you'll be kicked out into utter darkness where there'll be gnashing of teeth forever and ever. And so we need to be ready. Now, if you die in Christ, you might be what's called a lucky one or something because when you die and you believe in Jesus, and so you're a Christian, then it doesn't matter what kind of structure your doctrines are in, or what kind of lies you believed, or whatever, you're going to go through what's called death gate, and it's not going to have a sting or a victory over you. And through that death gate, you're going to be prepared to be able to wear your wedding gown. Whatever happens when you're going through death gate is going to equal what happens for the Christians that are alive and remain and will be raptures going to go through while they're yet alive. You get to go through it if you die in death's gate. But one thing about that is you're guaranteed that once that's over with and the dead rise first, you're going to rise because when you die and you still believe in Jesus, then you're totally guaranteed to be living with Jesus forever in heaven and earth and, earth and wherever else he, what it's going to be like when, it, when we get there. But those of us that are left and remain, we still have free will. We can choose what we want. We could choose Antichrist. We can choose Jesus. We can choose nothing, as it were. We got a choice. So you can, and you can turn your backs on Jesus. You do a lot of things while you're yet, yet alive because you're going to be seeing and hearing things what the dead will hear and see as they go through death's gate to get ready to be a Jesus. We need to be ready. We need to be able to slip into our wedding gown. And if the wedding gown doesn't fit, we're not going up. And, you know, people like to say, well, if you believe, once saved, always saved. Basically, that's true. But you have a free choice. You can choose. And the Bible indicates that about two-thirds of Christians is going to choose to reject Jesus, because when Jesus sends his two messengers out and the things that are going to happen, so many of you are believing you should have not come through the tribulation, so you probably think, well, you're already toast, so it doesn't matter what you do. And you don't like the two witnesses because they're really messing up your life and sending plagues and all kinds of stuff, and, and you just want them dead. It's going to be a great shaking during the ministry, the 1260-day ministry of the two witnesses. Because they have the task of getting the church ready so when, when the rapture comes, you can get right in, slip right into your wedding gown. Because when you're accepting Jesus, this is a specific thing. You're, Jesus is, is asking you to marry him. So you're getting an engagement. So you accept Jesus, you believe in him, and this becomes your engagement to Jesus. Because once Jesus returns, he's already waited 2,000 years. He's really anxious. He wants to hurry up and marry the one he loves. And he loves all the Christians because they're his bride. And so as soon as you are raptured or you're raised from the dead, you need to be ready to get married so you need to be in your wedding gown and then we meet Jesus in the air and as Revelation chapter 11 18 says he has his rewards with him and he's given them to him everybody that loves him and so forth that was raised from the dead and were in the rapture he's going to give the rewards out to them and this happens after a significant set of events. Half of the tribulation period has gone by, and according to the Bible, 
that's as many as half of the world population is killed. So when this starts for living Christians, you're going to be able to look out and see massive stuff happening, destruction, plagues, war, imprisonment, all kinds of stuff going on. It's not going to be a fa f very fun time. It's going to be scary, but yet we hear lo often preach that God has given us a spirit of fear. Well, you're going to be scared because it's scary when you think you're going to get killed, but we have that eternal peace of knowing that if we do get killed, or we have to go through things, Jesus is with us and we'll live eternity with him. Uh, so we got a lot of exciting things. We hear often there's going to be a great revival, the end time revival, and there is. There's going to be churches are going to overflow and, and pastors that don't know what they're doing because they don't quite understand why their churches are filling up and everything are going to have to have quick learning of what's going on to try to meet the needs of all the people pouring in the church. But there's a price tag to the revival that is never talked about. You just can't have a great revival where so many people are coming to Jesus without having the haters of Jesus or the unbelievers take a note of it and really thinking, what can they do about it? You know, we have the organization that tries to get rid of anything Christian uh, emblems or whatever in around government whatsoever. They're trying to take prayer out of the school and all kinds of stuff like that. Well, that's just child's play compared to what's going to be happening when the revival comes. Because revival means lots of people are getting saved. Just It's just amazing what's going to be happening. But the results of that is going to aggravate governments and unbelievers to no end where then we're going to be able to see how how we can fill up these re-education slave labor camps because it basically would be illegal to be a Christian is how it's going to end up being. And so we're having some significant events coming ahead and we're going to notice the beginning of this again as a peace deal. And we hear all the time this, the, the issues between Israel and the Palestines and the Middle East and everything. We live in every day with who knows, a, a world war can develop out of it. Nuclear bombs can start flying. Uh, we, Israel, anytime they think they're bothered in any way or something, they send out the planes and attack. We just had this not too long ago where they they went and uh, sent their planes. In fact, they got one of their planes shot down, but they went and, and bombed an area in Syria. So, and they're, they won't hesitate in doing any of this kind of stuff. And, and what will end up being a world war of sort. We got this Gog and Magog war, which involves Russia and a good part of the Middle East where they they plan for some reason or another they think they can get away with it and they plan to go and invade Israel and uh, as they do that according to Ezekiel chapter 38 39 30, th that five six of their armies will be killed practically in instant well what we know today something like that has to be in the something to do with nuclear bombs or something a conventional war doesn't kill everybody that quick and so they could be a considerable number of people killed and that would put a great dent in in Islam belief because all the power that backed it up will be dead and only one sixth of them will survive and so they'll be real ready to make a peace deal so it could be that this kind of a war will start before the tribulation these are kind of things about the Bible is that there's a lot of prophecy in there and 
for 2,000 years, people have tried to interpret that. And there's churches, 37,000 denominations of Christianity, and they all have their doctrine. Some of them are the same, and some of them are radically different. And, and, but 2,000 years have come and gone, and many of them have proved to be wrong. We keep saying, well, Jesus is going to re return such and such month and such and such day. Well, so far it hasn't happened. And what we see in the process as time goes by, Wow, there's a lot of stuff that really needed to be before Jesus can return. You know, we got to get this one world government going, and it seemed like we got a good structure for it, but it's still not happening. We're still not in the tribulation, and and as time goes on, and we pass this date and that date and the other date of people predicting the end, and we got the. 2018 is full of the, these kinds of dates of, of ultimate disasters coming. And so what, what's it's going to be? Is it going to be that what we hear today is something that sounds real interesting and gets our excitement up and then <coughs> the date comes and goes? And, and then what we usually feel find out is is that either ministries fall away because they so depended on their prediction or their prophecy they were saying, or they readjust themselves and relook at things and find out that, hey, guess what? Things are now happening that need to happen to make a one world government work. We need a system that can <clears throat> track every human on earth so that they can be prevented from buying or selling unless they're worshiping Antichrist. And even a few years ago, we're all sure that this is possible, but we weren't quite that sure. And as it turns out, we're just now seeing things that is being implemented that indicates that instantaneously a billion people can be tracked in all of their actions and stuff. In, the, in India, they have implemented a system. They got a number for all of its citizens, and it's either 80% or more larger uh, activated, where you, you have to have that mark if you want any social services, if you want to buy anything at the store, if you want anything, you got to have this number from the government. And the computers they have and the software they have can track everybody instantly. And we've been told they, 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 so the computers can already pretty much do that. The problem is the computers can do that, and now they're getting better. It's just that the data has to be entered. And so our, all our data is getting into these computers and our actions, which can be instantaneously tracked. And you have to have this kind of technology, and we're just seeing now, in 2018, we're at the point where switches could be thrown and systems could be enacted that work pretty good, an infrastructure uh, system to be able to track every human action. And it shouldn't be that hard, because already at least 80% of the United States don't use money. They just use credit, plastic, to do all their transactions. Very rarely people are using money these days. And so we have lots of things that needs to be prepared. And when we think it should have already been done, like maybe it, in the year 2000, you think, well... Jesus would have to return in that first seven years or something. We've got to get that tribulation going. But it didn't happen. Uh, it came and gone. And now we're in 2018. And, and we're still looking around to see, well, what else needs to be done? But sure enough, we find things that really need to, to be. Maybe it's important to have driverless cars. Maybe that has some implication to, that is necessary uh, it doesn't seem like it, but I mean, we don't know what it is that really needs to be in place for an infrastructure for Antichrist can control the world. 
and it's not like back in Jesus' day, somebody says, well, somebody, oh, Caesar can do it, or any of these people we had that was thought to be Antichrist in those days, because there's no way whatsoever that in those days they can control anything. Nowadays, we can. Whoever's in the power right now, the strongest person in the world is Trump, whether we like it or not. And he's making such waves that it, that it should be scary. He's, he's trying to make on a few fronts where we can have nuclear war, and, it's, and it seemed like inedible. And are we that close to the tribulation period? Again, people think all Christians will be gone when the tribulations start. But Antichrist has to make war against the saints and overcome them. What, what saints is he going to overcome when all the saints are gone and suddenly they got to be a whole new crop of saints? Well, people like to say, well, some kind of revival starts in the, as soon as the rapture takes place. And so a lot of new Christians appear because so many people accept Jesus. So those are the people that Antichrist is going to make war on? No, Antichrist is going to be, going to be making war and overcome the saints because they haven't been in the rapture yet. And it's part of the testing and preparation so that you could be able to slip into your wedding gown when... Jesus returns. Now, what never passes away is the simple belief that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the Christ, cross to pay the price for your sin. So if you believe this, then that is what's necessary. And to obey God is to, is to believe this. If you say to obey God is to somehow obey the law of Moses, then you're, you've got to obey every last law of Moses and not leave any of them out. And so Jesus makes it simple for us. He says to love God with all your being, which takes care of the first four of the Ten Commandments, and to love your neighbor of yourself, which takes care of the last six of the Ten Commandments. So if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you're, you're basically obeying the law. The whole law is fulfilled in that. Loving God and loving your neighbor. And so f today, you don't seem to have a problem loving God, but you seem to have a huge problem loving your neighbor. Now, you love your friends, and you, you can read the parables, and, and you can read about Jesus saying, it's easy to die for your friend, but to die for a stranger, you wouldn't do. And so today, you go to the church that you love and would love you, but you won't love anybody outside that church, though you believe you are, and maybe you try to be decent and everything, great, wonderful, but it's a simple to get saved. And so do this right now. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Say, God, I believe that you sent Jesus to pay the price for my sins on that cross, that he died on the cross, spilled his blood to pay the price for my sins. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. A simple prayer gets you saved. Now you believe that Jesus rose three days later from the dead. When they took him down and put him in the grave, he rose three days later. And then 40 days after that, he went to heaven. So you're believing that he died on the cross and he rose on the third day. Now read the King James Version Bible. Get to know Jesus. And in Acts chapter 2, it tells you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ask Jesus to baptize the Holy Spirit. You'll be given the ability to pray, make intercessory prayer in a language you haven't learned. And you, there's gifts of the Spirit. One of those gifts are healing, and healing is for today. So you put your hand on a place of pain on your body. Got your hand there? In the name of Jesus, be healed. Now, tune in every week at the same time that you're watching here. I'll be on. And help me out a little. Go to my website and press the GoFundMe button or the Donate button. Give a little, give a lot, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. See you next time. God bless you.